Oh, that with, sounds promising. Yeah, with great pleasure today that I'm welcoming welcoming Ellie uh, Culver from the National Dragonfly, well, from British Dragonfly Society, uh, who run the National Dragonfly Recording Scheme. So I've known Ellie for a number of years, and I personally approached her for a swap in dragonflies because um, she's been wonderful to work with in the past, and I knew she'd do an absolutely fantastic talk. And dragonflies are one of those invertebrate groups that actually most people really adore, even though they're really brutal predators. In real <laughs> True. So, yeah, I'm going to hand over to Ellie now, and she is going to tell us all about uh, the recording dragonflies across the UK. So over to you, Ellie. Excellent. And thank you, Kieran, so much for inviting me to participate in Ento Live. Um, it's an absolutely wonderful resource. Um, and yes, so uh, today I'm talking about the National Dragonfly Recording Scheme, and we're going to be covering uh, basically the history of the recording scheme, what we record and why, how you can take part, and a quick look at some of our spring species, which are currently on the wing or will be soon. Uh, so my name is Ellen McCulver. I'm the Conservation Officer for the British Dragonfly Society. Uh, I am the top dragonfly in this photo. Um, so one of my main jobs is to um, manage the recorded, National Recording Scheme for Dragonflies, along with our officers up in Scotland and our fantastic team of volunteers. Uh, coincidentally, it's actually the BDS's 40th birthday this month. Um, so, yes, we started back in uh, 1983. Uh, it was formed by just a handful of uh, dragonfly enthusiasts um, and then became a registered charity in 1988. Uh, since then, we've grown to a charity with more than 1,800 members and we currently have a staff team of six people um, and we are now kind of the, the leading um, well, the leading forces anyway in uh, the conservation of dragonflies and their wetland habitats um, across Britain. So you can join in the celebration with us um, online uh, via the website. Uh, you can sign up to our e-newsletter, monthly e-newsletter, which is free. Just go to the, the um, our website and you can sign up via the front page or you can follow along on social media. Um, we love to hear about your dragonfly stories and see your photos. Uh, so do follow along and hopefully we'll have some birthday celebration activities. I think there's a photo competition that's going to be happening. So that should be quite fun. Um, also, please do check out um, our um, event section of our website. We host um, a range of field meetings and family fun days um, across um, the UK um, from yeah, field meetings uh, to uh partnership events at our dragonfly hotspots such as Langos lakes um so do check that out they're also listed in our e-news letter and mentioned on social media um we're also hosting our first um in-person agm and annual meeting uh since the beginning of lockdown um, and that's going to be happening on the 18th of november this year at uh, Nottingham Trent University. Um, so if you can come along to that, um, please do. Um, it's open to everybody, but members do get a discount. Um, coincidentally, if you are interested in membership, I've got to do my bit about membership, I'm sorry. Um, it is um, only £20 per year, um, so it's it's pretty good, really. Um, you get um, our um, bi-annual, so twice a, um, twice a year uh, membership magazine, uh, subscription to our um the BDS uh, Dragonfly Journal, um, uh, invitations to all our events, um, and obviously all the money um, from your membership goes towards the BDS and the work that we do. So uh, back to the recording scheme. Um, so the actually the National Recording Scheme was set up by the Biological Recording Centre uh, back in 1968 uh, with the aim of uh, mapping the distribution of dragonflies in Britain and Ireland. Um, but the, uh, the recording scheme was then taken over by the BDS uh, once the society was formed. Uh, the data set is publicly available on the website MBN Atlas. Um, and although um, it was formed in the 60s, um, the recording scheme holds historical records dating back to the 1800s. So it's an absolutely fantastic resource. Um, I believe we currently hold over 1,800,000 records for dragonflies in the database. Um, and at the moment, we're kind of comfortably receiving um, over 30,000 records uh, a year, um, new records a year um, into the database. Okay. 
So what's all this data used for? I mean, obviously, a lot of effort's gone into creating this database. Um, well, one, it goes towards um, BDS publications and those formed by other organizations, um, including atlases. Um, and these are fantastic guides to for teaching uh, new recorders and um, the general public um, about dragonflies and their distribution. Um, so that's one of the, the, the key uses. Um, another is identifying species in need. Uh, so you might have seen, if you follow the BDS, we published in um, the uh, State of Dragonflies in Britain and Ireland 2021 report. Um, and um, in that report, um, it looks at our 46 resident or regular migrant species um, and looks at data um, over a 50 year period uh, from 1970 to 2019. And it looks at changes in occupancy. Um, occupancy is defined as the proportion of a geographical area where a species of interest is found um, each year. Um, so over that 50 year period, it found that 19 of our resident species uh, had significantly increased in occupancy. Uh, those are the ones highlighted in green, um, whereas um, five um, had um, significantly decreased in occupancy. Uh, and the three um, most significant of those was the emerald damselfly, black daughter, and common hawker. And obviously, uh, the results of this report are really important for the BDS. Um, and um, from this report, now these three species um, are highlighted as priority species of interest uh, for research into um, threats and causes of occupancy change, um, as well as conservation. Um, the database is also being used by myself at the moment to conduct um, a review of the Odonata Red List for Great Britain, which was previously produced in 2008. Uh, the current list includes, well, it lists four species as endangered, uh, two species as vulnerable, and six as near threatened. Um, so the process uh, basically involves categorizing species um, based on risk of extinction. Uh, for Odonata in Britain, we're looking at uh, um, restricted um, uh, the size of a uh, species range, uh, changes in range, um, and um, whether there is continuing threat to a uh, species population. And so that's currently um, underway at the moment. And then the red list is um, used by other environmental organizations to uh, prioritize uh, which species uh, they um, provide funding um, and resources towards um, in terms of conservation. Um, and it also influences uh, legislation, for example, which species uh, receive uh, legal protection under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. The data, because it's publicly available, it could be used by a range of organisations um, and could be used to identify priority sites for dragonflies. For example, um, it is used by local planning authorities um, and biodiversity officers um, to identify priority species for dragonflies um, and to assess uh, the potential implications of um, planning developments um, on dragonfly habitat. Um, the uh, research is, uh, sorry, the database um, we also um, promote uh, to uh, for use by universities and research organizations. Um, for example, it's currently being used in a um, uh, a uh, project, um, a project research project called uh, Drivers and Repercussions of UK Insect Declines. Um, we were approached by Leeds University to get involved in this. Um, it's a, a, a multi uh, partnership um, uh, uh, research project, um, and this is looking at um, the potential implications of insect decline and predicting changes in uh, range and what and identifying the drivers of uh, insect decline. So, I mean, Odonata um, as a group of insects are absolutely fascinating to study. And I'm sure if you're new to dragonflies, as soon as you start to watch them, you'll you'll fall in love with them as well. Um, they're one of the most ancient groups of insects. They've been around for over 300 million years, long before the dinosaurs. Um, and in the order, you have two suborders of insects, Anisoptera, which are the true dragonflies, and Zygoptera, the damselflies. Globally, there are over 5,000 known species. 
Um, but in the UK, we have 46 species which are recognised as being resident and breeding um, or uh, regular migrants who are recorded um, in the UK on a regular basis, um, but are migrants from continental Europe. We also have 10 vagrant species which have been recorded, so species that have only have a couple of records that have turned up, sometimes turn up after extreme weather events where they've been blown across the sea um, and, and turned up randomly. Um, and then we have two species which have unfortunately become extinct in the UK. So how you detail the difference between a dragonfly um, and a damselfly? Um, in adults, um, first you could look at the head, the eyes, in dragonflies, you can see that the eyes uh, cover almost the entire head and meet in the middle, whereas in damselflies, the eyes are smaller and at either side of the head. Uh, wing shape, um, so uh, the forewings um, of a dragonfly are um, smaller and less wide than the hind wings, whereas in damselflies, um, the wings are the same size. Uh, body shape, dragon, generally dragonflies are chunkier and bigger, where damselflies are more dainty. And you can also look at behaviour. So dragonflies generally rest with their wings uh, outspread, whereas damselflies rest with their wings along the back. And then in flight as well, dragonflies are generally described as being more powerful flies than damselflies. Um, in terms of anatomy, uh, your general insect anatomy, so head, abdomen, well, head, thorax, abdomen, uh, abdomen made out of 10 segments, uh, six legs and two pairs of wings. When identifying dragonflies, um, you'll be asked to look at specific um, features of the anatomy and specific um, markings. Um, and some of, these are some of the phrases that are used. Uh, the fronds refers to basically the face of the dragonfly. The pronotum is like a little um, plate at the back of a damselfly's head. And humeral stripes refer to the band markings or the, the shoulder stripes, if you will, um, on the thorax. And you also see a, you'll hear what's mentioned as a coagrion spur on damselflies, which is the little spur like marking on the side of some damselflies. On the wings, you've got the pterostigma, which is the, um, the big wing spot. Uh, the leading wing vein is called the costa, and, uh, and some species is coloured. And then you have the node, which is like the little um, branch in the wing veins um, halfway along the, fore, the, fr the front of the wing. Oop, off of the near. Close you. Right. Um, also in anatomy, um, it's possible to identify male and females. Um, in males, you'll find the accessory genitalia um, near the top um, of the abdomen. And then down at the end of the abdomen, you have the anal appendages. Um, so the top, you've got um, anal appendages on the brown hawker. Um, and then bottom, you've got uh, the anal appendages on a scarce emerald damselfly. Um, and then in females, um, obviously, it's a bit different. Um, so instead, they have a ovipositor used for egg laying. Um, and this can be a lot more obvious in some species than others. Um, I always find that, that they're quite obvious in hawker species, particularly southern hawker. Um, and then some species have a quite an obvious fulvous scale pointing down, such as in the black data. So I'll quickly go over the life cycle. Um, so um, dragonflies start off as eggs, as you might expect. Um, so eggs are either laid directly into the water, and um, this is referred to as like exophytic eggs, and they kind of look like frog spawn a bit, whereas um, some species lay their eggs, well, insert their eggs into um, plant material or organic vegetation in or above the water surface, and these kind of are a lot kind of longer and elongated. Um, and dragonflies either um, go through um, the eggs either go through direct development where they will hatch after two to five weeks um, if the eggs are laid by species which is on the wing in kind of early spring um, from spring to early summer or they might undergo delayed development um, if they are um, laid by species which is on the wing um, in late summer autumn time so with darters um, so the eggs are laid um, and then they undergo kind of um, a torpor period um, a kind of hibernation period over the winter, and then the eggs hatch out in spring once water temperatures start to warm. 
Larva. Um, so dragonfly and damselfly larva are very easy to tell apart. Uh, damselfly larvae all look quite similar, long and thin. Three caudal lamellae at the end of the abdomen, which is used for respiration. Um, dragonfly larvae don't have any caudal lamellae, uh, and their body shape varies quite a bit. So they can be squat and spider-like, or more elongated um, and kind of described as torpedo shape. Um, and dragonfly, damselfly larvae generally um, take one to three years to develop. Um, and as they develop, um, they go through a series of molts, um, shedding their um, um, outer exoskeleton um, as they grow. I believe that can be up to 14 times. Um, yes, generally um, two, one to three years um, it takes them to develop. Um, but um, for example, in the golden ring dragonfly, which lives in cooler conditions um, up, up on mountain uh, um, streams and rivers, um, that can take five to seven years to develop. Um, so let's see if this video works for you. Might be a bit jittery, we shall see. Um, but dragonflies hunt using what's called the labium, which is a um, hinged jaw um, on the uh, um, front of their face, which enables them to lash out and catch prey um, at a uh, rapid rate. Um, if this video is a bit jittery, don't worry, um, it'll be available later um, on YouTube to rewatch. Um, but yeah, they're voracious predators. Um, and will um, feed on anything really that they can get their hands on. Uh, a lot of kind of small invertebrates, um, such as midge larvae, but also um, their uh, larger species will take small fish tadpoles. Ooh, where's my emergence video gone? Uh, so I'm just going to show you a quick emergence video. Um, so once a dragonfly is do, 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 do. Media player, here we go. Share. So once a dragonfly is um, ready to, is fully, dragonfly alive is fully matured, um, it um, climbs out of the water and finds a secure perch uh, where it can undergo emergence, um, which you can see here. This is a common club tail, which you often find um, emerging on riverbanks. Uh, where the back of the uh, larval exoskeleton splits and the adult dragonfly emerges. Um, and this can take um, up to a couple of hours. So during this period, dragonfly is, um, uh, the adult dragonfly is, uh, is really susceptible to predation. Um, uh, obviously, it's got to wait until its body's hard enough. Its wings have um, uh, fully inflated, if you will. Um, it pumps um, body fluids into the wings to allow them to expand. Uh, they then have to harden off. Um, and then the adult is ready to take its maiden flight. Do so, um, Ellie. Sorry. Yes. Just when you can you stop sharing and reshare because that black box is appearing. So. Oh you know, no! Oh yeah! Sorry. <laughs> Got to untick. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Sorry, everyone. These were the tech issues that we were sorting out. Just no we right. Okay. Is it gone now? It's perfect. Now. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so um once the dragonfly is uh, fully hardened off, um it's referred to as what we call a teneral dragonfly, um, a newly emerged dragonfly. Um, you can see um a teneral dragonfly on the left. Um, as you can see, it's a lot. It's quite pale and it takes a few days for um, the adult dragonfly to develop its mature coloration. Um, and uh, during this period, it'll kind of fly off and I will forage um, and seek refuge in, in vegetation. Um, dragonflies themselves um, are um, voracious hunters. Um, they feed mostly on, on small flies, midges, mosquitoes, which is great for us. But larger species like the emperor in this picture can can eat uh, wasps and moths as well. Um, and once the adult is fully matured, got its full um, mature coloration, um, it's ready to mate. Um, some species like the emperor dragonfly, um, the males are highly territorial. Um, the um, males will defend um, what they perceive to be um, prime egg laying um, ha habitat. Um, and do, 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 here we are. Um, so mating um, begins with the uh, male grasping the female round the back of the head. 
um, and they may stay like this for a while. Um, and this is called uh, being in tandem. Uh, if the female is susceptible, um, she'll bring her abdomen up to meet the male's accessory genitalia and they form the mating wheel. Um, and this can last for literally um, a couple of seconds uh, to a few hours, for example, in the blue-tailed damselfly. Um, so it really varies. Um, and once that's uh, completed, um, the female will either fly off um, with the male still attached in tandem um, and she'll egg lay. Um, or she will, um, the male will separate, but he may guard her um, until she's finished egg laying just to make sure that no uh, male uh, mates with her beforehand. And should have a quick video of them doing so here. This is common data, so the male still stays attached uh, when he's egg laying and the female is laying her eggs directly into the water, dipping her, the end of her abdomen into the water. Do, do, do. Um, so as I said earlier, um, I, I mentioned that we get regular migrants to the UK. Um, this is one of them. This is the red vein data. Uh, we usually get influx influxes every year from the continent. Um, it's very widespread, spe bleh, widespread species um, across continental Europe. Um, and it's known to disperse long distances to find uh, suitable uh, breeding wetlands. Um, dispersal with um, dragonflies really varies species to species. For example, um, the endangered and protected southern damselfly, which we have here in the UK. Uh, one of the issues it's so endangered is because it uh, has very limited dispersal ability and rarely flies more than a few kilometres away from its um, wetland of origin. So now you know a little bit about dragonflies, how do you start recording them? Um, here are a few things that you'll need. Um, we recommend a pair of close focusing binoculars could be really useful. Um, a dragonfly net for um, handling some of the uh, smaller uh, damselfly species. The blue and black ones, uh, black damselflies can be a bit tricky sometimes. So having a having an uh, insect net could be useful. Um, a holder for holding the damselflies in. An identification guide. Um, here are three that we recommend, uh, some of the most up-to-date ones. Uh, pen and paper or a phone for taking your notes. And a camera can also be useful uh, for uh, taking photos. And then if you're not entirely sure on the species, um, you can then look at the photos later um, to check your identification. Um, so when do you go looking for dragonflies? Um, so in general, drag adult dragonflies are most abundant in the UK from May to September. Uh, the dragonfly season starts earlier down in the south uh, of the country, obviously because it's warmer. Um, generally, um, best conditions where you're going to see the most dragonflies are on sunny, calm, warm condition, uh, warm days uh, with no rain. Um, as an insect, they like warm conditions. And you can see them throughout daylight hours, but they're generally um, most abundant from late morning to early afternoon. Um, and be aware that with, as with other species like um, bees, butterflies, um, different species have different flight periods. Um, so that is an important ID check, um, ID tip when trying to identify a species, check the flight period. Where to look? Um, so um, all dragonflies are freshwater, uh, are associated with freshwater. I mean, you can pretty much run into, as a flying insect, you can run into uh, dragonflies pretty much anywhere. Um, we get calls from people who have them stuck in their office buildings and they don't know what to do. Um, yeah, get stuck in people's conservatories. But um, generally, you're most likely to run into them um, at freshwater wetland sites uh, where they breed and egg lay. Um, some species um, are very habitat, um, very habitat spe specific, whereas others are more generalist. For example, common darters um, are found in a range, are associated with a range of freshwater wetlands um, from brackish ditches to bogs. Um, to garden ponds, whereas the common club tail on the other on the right hand side um, can only be found breeding in lowland, slow flowing, mature rivers. Where to look? Um, ID tip three is to check a species range. Um, some are far more common and wide ranging than others. Uh, for example, the keel skimmer, skimmer versus the black tailed skimmer. The males of both species look kind of superficially quite similar. However, the black-tailed skimmer is a lot more common. A few other identification tips. Uh, so how do you go about identifying a species? Well, you can look at the, the general size and shape. As we, we saw, the common club tail earlier is called a club tail for a reason. 
with club tail shaped body. Um, you can look at sex. So we looked at how you identify whether a species um, a dragonfly is male or female earlier. But generally, in, in a lot of species, um, males and females are a different color. And you can also get different. There's also uh, females of a species often have different color morphs as well. Also, in relation to color, um, it can change with age. So as we saw, tenorals start off um, quite pale. And in some species, you can find that the adults become quite drab as they age, for example, in the common data. Markings as well. So look at markings on the thorax and the abdomen and the head in the case of some damselflies. So here are a few of our spring species, large red damselfly, common garden pond species, which can, which can be found emerging in large numbers. A main flight period, May to August, and is associated with a ra wide range of freshwater habitats like the common, uh, common data. Here's the male, uh, mostly black and red, uh, black legs, red eyes, red and black thorax, and a mostly red abdomen with black banding. Females vary in terms of coloration. Uh, again, black legs, black, uh, red eyes, um, but the amount of black on the abdomen varies quite a lot. Uh, from almost entirely black to just black banding and it has red and yellow coloration also. Banded demoiselle, a very popular species because it's so beautiful obviously. <laughs> uh, her uh, main flight period uh, May to August. Uh, favorite habitat includes is uh, running, um, uh, running water, so slow flowing rivers, streams and canals are the habitats that it's associated with. Uh, males are very recognisable with the banded wings and the bluey green metallic uh, body. Females, on the other hand, um, are greeny bronze uh, in coloration and have green tinged wings. Uh, not to be confused with beautiful demoiselle females who have brown tinged wings. Broad body chaser, um, May flight period, May to July. Uh, favourite habitats, ponds, ditches and small lakes. Uh, this is often the first species that you'll get if you dig a new garden and pond. Males, obviously it's called broad body for a reason. Uh, a beautiful blue abdomen with the yellow markings and then the dark wing bases. Females are similar but have the yellowy okra um, coloured uh, abdomen. Um, we mentioned earlier that species uh, can change colour as they age. Um, in some species, the males will start off uh, with the coloration of a female. Um, so that's true for broad-bodied chasers. Um, so the male will actually start off with the coloration of the female and will slowly develop its blue coloration. Um, you don't really need to worry about this in terms of recording. We're not generally interested in the sex of the uh, dragonfly, uh, just the species. And lastly, the four-spotted chaser, um, one of the most widespread species of dragonfly in the UK. Uh, it used to be the symbol of the BDS, actually, when it first started. Um, main flight period, May to, May to August. Uh, again, favours a wide range of habitats, uh, are still water, but also uses slow-flowing uh, rivers and canals and streams. And the males and females look incredibly similar uh, with the browny, yellowy, uh, Thorax and abdomen, uh, black tip to the abdomen, um, and then on the wings you've got the dark base, uh, dark pterostigma wing spots, and then dark spots on the nodes as well. So once you've identified a species, um, what do you need to record? At a minimum, you need to record the species, uh, give the location and name, and you'll need a grid reference. Um, you don't need to worry about the grid reference straight away because you can work that out later. Um, or you can get an app on your phone uh, for grid references. Um, there's quite a few available. Uh, you also need to note the date of when you saw it. Uh, so that's the minimum. But if you're feeling a little bit more confident and you're uh, confident that you can recognise uh, all your kind of local species, uh, then please do consider um, adopting a site to record at. Uh, this is basically just committing to visiting a site three times a year between May and September. Uh, so early, uh, so kind of spring, early summer, midsummer, and then late to early autumn. Um, and you're committing to doing this every year. Um, recording should take place on days with good conditions for dragonflies, so warm, sunny, calm. 
And all it involves doing is creating a complete species list. So literally just listing all the species that you encounter uh, during your visit. So a really simple survey project. So recording adults is generally um, a suitable method for most species in terms of identifying uh, whether it is present within an area. However, it isn't suitable for all species. Um, for example, uh, the northern damselfly. And for these species, we actually have targeted species projects. Um, so for the northern damselfly, um, this is a species which has a very restricted distribution to the uh, just the west of Scotland. Um, and being Scotland, conditions are not always great for dragonflies to be in flight. They're often quite cool, quite wet. Um, so adult dragonfly, um, adult northern damselflies are not always particularly obvious flying around. Um, and they're also quite an inconspicuous species that are often confused with other blue and black damselflies. Uh, so in this project, we're actually getting volunteers um, to visit uh, potential northern damselfly breeding pools. Uh, this is a species that's associated with um, shallow, acidic, sheltered pools uh, with abundant vegetation. Um, and they're looking for larva. Um, so the larva um, are actually quite easy to identify um, from the uh, spots on their heads and also by the ridges on the caudal lamellae, which are pointed out by the arrow. <clears throat> and this can just be done in the field with a hand lens. Another example of a targeted species project we're currently running is the Willow Emerald Watch. And this is focused on the Willow Emerald Damselfly. Uh, this is a, a new, actually a re quite a recent species um, to the UK. Um, back in 2009, I think it was, um, a, a large uh, number were recorded in South East Suffolk and uh, East, Ke uh, East Essex um, on the coast. And since then, the species has spread um, across a large proportion of England and now can be found as far north as North Yorkshire and as far uh, west as uh, Warwickshire. Uh, you can identify the species um, by uh, just looking at the adults. Um, it can be identified by its pale terror stigma and by the spur marking on its side. Um, you often find them uh, at wetlands with um, still slow flowing water and um, uh, bankside overhanging tree growth and vegetation. Um, however, you can also, this is one of the few species you can actually uh, survey quite easily um, in winter uh, by looking for egg laying scars. So this is the only species in the UK that egg lays into woody vegetation, uh, preferably uh, branches such as willow, hence the name, um, that overhang the water. Um, you'll see kind of lines of little dimples uh, where the female has overposited her egg. However, they will use a range of vegetation, um, of woody vegetation, um, including brambles. Uh, so in this project, we're asking people to go out during winter months when the trees are bare, looking, uh, checking branches uh, for uh, overposition scars. Um, and that's one of our, our other targeted um, dragonfly uh, recording projects. I also just wanted to mention as well our Migrant Dragonflies project. Uh, so there's a Facebook uh, for this project. Um, and it's basically a group where people can, uh, for people who are particularly interested in recording migrant dragonflies, um, so things like your red veined darters, uh, your vagrant emperors, uh, like the, the one on the screen. Um, so they share their sightings and photos on the Facebook group, um, also on Twitter as well. Um, and then um, you can read a report uh, regarding migrant dragonfly activity in the UK um, in our membership uh, in the project report. Um, but do do um, join this Facebook group um, if this is a topic that interests you. Um, another one of our main roles is assisting uh, site uh, owners and volunteers to set up uh, monitoring projects. Uh, so monitor a monitoring project is basically um, a long term surveying project with a set uh, structured methodology. Um, and this can be used um, if you're for example, particularly interested in monitoring the health of a endangered species that you have on site, or for example, if you're uh, if you're interested in um, uh, looking at the effects of changes in habitat management on your um, uh, dragonfly populations. Uh, so we've been involved in setting up dragonfly monitoring projects at um, a number of um, beaver reintroduction sites, such as uh, Willington Wetlands in uh, the outskirts of Derby. 
um, and in monitoring projects, um, as well as looking at uh, just species, you're going to probably be wanting to record um, more information than that uh, to get a better idea of how our population is faring. Uh, so during monitoring projects, often people will do, look at um, counting dragonflies, uh, count data, a uh, number of individuals they see, uh, recording the number of uh, copulating pairs that are encountered, uh, the number of overpositing females, and the number of emerging adults that are encountered. Uh, they may also want to look at, for exuvia and the left behind exo shed exoskeletons of larva, and maybe pond dip for larva as well. Um, generally, uh, the two methodologies for uh, when monitoring are um, either transect walks, similar to what you do with butterflies or birds. You set up a set uh, pathway that you're going to walk. This is very useful, for example, if you're walking, if you're wanting to survey a open stream, you just walk along the riverbank and record what you see. Or for example, if you have a small pond, you might want to do a point count um, where you just stand um, at a set point for a certain amount of time and record what you see. Usually during um, uh, monitoring project surveys, um, information uh, such as uh, time of monitoring, a time of day and weather um, conditions are also recorded because this will affect the amount of dragonflies that you see. Um, so we um, ask that everybody um, enters their data into iRecord uh, so it can be uh, verified um, by um, our team of county dragonfly recorders um, and it is then exported to MBN Atlas. Um, so I just want to quickly show you just to finish um, where to um, where to go to enter your uh, records. Um, so let me just share my screen for one last time. Do, do, do. So if you go to our website, hopefully you can all see this, uh, you go to recording and then submit your records. Our website is going to be really slow now, I know it. Oh no, here we go. Um, so if you go down, you can enter a single dragonfly record or a list of dragonfly records. Um, you can also, uh, if you want, um, just use a, a spreadsheet, um, a set spreadsheet that we've created um, if you've got a large number of records and you could submit that uh, directly to your county dragonfly recorder. Um, but if you go um, follow on these links, um, you don't have to sign into our record. It'll take you directly um, to the page. I'll just give a quick example. Um, British and flies. Why do I have such a long email address? Here we go. Um, what did you see? Got to enter your date. That you have to enter that's one of the few things you definitely have to um, record uh, record a name for your species brown hawker oh i should be able to spell hawker by now here we go and here you have uh information if you're doing a monitoring survey and you're collecting additional information such as adult count copulating pairs overpositing females overposition scars for willow emeralds larvae, exuvia and emerging adults. You can add a comment and you can add an image uh, which helps the um, uh, county dragonfly recorder verify your sighting. And then you can tick uh, if you recorded all species, if you're doing a complete list. And then you put where you see, so you need to put a name of your location. It's called Ellie Pond. <laughs> Ellie's Pond. Here we go. Um, you can enter site type if you want, so what it is. Uh, and then you need to give spatial reference. So you can either enter it or you can select it off the map. So zoom in and out. So I'm going to say I'm stuck here. Here we go. Entered. And then you can add additional comments there. And then you're done. So nice and simple. Um, and I think that's all I've got time for. I think I've probably run over a little bit. Um, so I'll just share, share my last screen slide. So it's got a nice picture on it. Um, but yes, I am now... Uh, happy to enter and answer any of your questions that you may have. And thank you again, Kieran. And thank you for everybody for listening.